I'm an alcoholic, a member of AA near Toronto, Canada, and my name is Dustin. It is customary to open our meeting with a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer. May we have that moment now, please. Serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not mine, be done. So, uh, Chairperson reads the pre AA preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other, that they may solve their common problem and to help other, others recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. So uh, once again, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Alderville Pioneer Group and uh, the Nightly Review Zoom Group. My name's Dustin. I'll be your chairperson this evening. Uh, and it says, chairperson briefly qualify. Um, you know, when it comes to alcohol, um, I could not stop when I, when I started and I could not stop starting. And um, you know, as I have learned in our, our literature, and as it showed up in my life, uh, my disease was progressive over the course of about 15 to 17 years. And um, near the end of my drinking, I got very sick. I was intervened on by my family. I went to a treatment center. And while in that treatment center, they told me that I, I needed to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I came to you guys. I, I got a group. Uh, I got a sponsor. And I started working at the 12 Steps uh, out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous as, as directed uh, by my sponsor. And, you know, because of all of you, because of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and, and the 12 steps and, and the God of my understanding, uh, you know, I'm here with you today and I'm sober and I, I hope that should qualify me. So next up, uh, we have the, we have the, 12 steps and my friend Michael B is going to read those for us tonight. Just got to unmute Michael. Just one second. You got it. Awesome. Hi, Michael alcoholic. Thanks for asking me, Dustin. It's an honor. 12 steps of alcoholics anonymous. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral, moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we are wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And 12, having had a spiritual awaken, awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And next up, we have the 12 traditions. And tonight I've asked Rick M to read those for us. So just unmute you, Rick. There you go. Oh. Try this again here, just one moment. There we go, Rick. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. I'm a proud member of the Gerard Road Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Rick. 12 traditions. One, our common welfare should come first. Person recovery depends upon a unity. Two, for a group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority. 
a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, less problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. 10. Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, the AA name ought never be drawn into public cont controversy. 11. A public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonym anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 12. Anonymity is a spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personality. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you, Rick. And now for our, uh, I guess you could say, main event. Uh, our, our speaker will be sharing for approximately one hour. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker. I've, I've heard his speaker tapes and uh, 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 so inspiring. And uh, got a young guy like me moving, moving my feet. Uh, really, really excited about this speaker. Uh, our speaker comes to us all the way from Long Beach, California. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mickey Bush. Hi, everybody. My name's Mickey Bush, and I'm a fully conceited alcoholic. Anyway. Um, just give me a little clue. Where is this going to? Where is this meeting located? We're just outside of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Oh, is that right? Good. I like that. And how long do you want me to talk for? 15, 20 minutes? Something like that? No, you can go for an hour, Mickey. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm probably going to go for about 20 minutes to half an hour, all right? All right, all right. Let's, let's see how it goes anyway. Um, you know, I've, I've been rushing today and you caught me on the hop because I kind of misplaced, I, I kind of missed this uh, 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 I kind of missed this uh, the, the whole thing and I'm just getting grief from my uh, my lady because I, I, I made a date and uh, couldn't keep it because of this. Anyway, Let's get on with the thing. I'm carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous and I identify as a fully conceited alcoholic because in the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous, this beautiful book, it says on page 30, we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. It's the first step in recovery, but it's not the first of the 12 steps. That's a totally different step. You know, though often confused. Um, this is a regular AA meeting, isn't it? Damn. Speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. <laughs> yes, yes, we meet Thank every you. Saturday Thank night. You. All right, all right. You are awake. You, you haven't fell asleep. Okay, good. So I, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous on January the 15th, 1983, I was so sick that I didn't even know I was sick. And that's really sick. When you're so sick, that you don't know you're sick, that's really sick. And when you're as sick as I was, so sick, you come into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and you scan the room and you think, I'm not as sick as him, or I'm not as sick as him, to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous thinking you ain't as sick as the next guy is really sick. So if there's anybody here tonight wondering whether they is or whether they isn't a real alcoholic or not, I want you to know that I can relate to being as sick as you don't think you are. Really sick, and I never knew on January the 15th, 1983. But you guys did, and I learned. And in the beautiful book, it said, we learned we had to fully concede. 
We had to. It wasn't optional. It wasn't take what you want and leave the rest or any of that kind of grief. You know, we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. It's the first step in recovery, but it's not the first of the 12 steps. I call this step the step before the steps because those two, first two steps are, are often confused. And I mean, we've only got one first step. You can't have two first steps. So this is the, the step that I call the step before the steps, which is totally different to the first of the 12 steps, which doesn't say anything about being an alcoholic. The same as this step doesn't say anything about powerlessness and unmanageability. And so we've got we to gotta define these things because a lot of newcomers, they don't get that message and information and they, they want to be sober and they build a sobriety on a shaky foundation. And we all know what happens to anything we build on a shaky foundation, don't we? So I've got to have rock solid. I've got to fully concede to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic. Now, how can I do that if I don't even know what it is about me that makes me alcoholic? Because I never knew. Am I disturbing somebody here? Is there something going on I don't know about? Hello? 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 Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're actually just looking. I, I think someone may have got unmuted by accident, but I'll take care of that, Mickey. You go right ahead. I apologize. Well, I don't want to disturb anybody, and if, they, if they're busy, you know. I... Anyway, you know, I didn't know what it was about me that made me alcoholic. I had no idea, but you guys did, and I asked. And I went round asking, what is it about me that makes me alcoholic? Because a guy got up in my face at the very first meeting I ever went to, and he said, you're an alcoholic. Now, contrary to what a lot of people think, our beautiful book don't say we don't tell folk they're alcoholic. It says we prefer not to, which is a totally different thing. This guy got up in my face and said, you're an alcoholic. I said, what? He said, you're an alcoholic. I said, that's a bloody mean thing to say to somebody. Why would you say a mean thing like that to somebody for? He said, you're an alcoholic. I said, why would you say that? He said, because if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and sounds like a duck and smells like a duck, it's a bloody duck. Just because he's been taking some shit and thinks he's an eagle, no, you're a duck. You're a duck, I'm a duck. Quack, quack, he went. I went, holy shit. Wow, this is the bloody funny farm. Guys are loving on you and shit and ducks and eagles. and but, I mean, I didn't know what to make of this bloody thing. I never knew. Because I just approached that meeting. I don't know nothing about AA meetings, but I don't know nothing about nothing. And as I approached the meeting, two dudes, who I now define as being uh, 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 greeters, greeting wet drunks like me who are coming along, they tell me I was grey, shaky and smelly when I got here. One of them stepped forward with his hand out like that. And I said, what do you want? He said, I want to welcome you to AA. I said, what? He said, welcome to AA. I said, what? And the other guy said, keep coming back. I said, what for? He said, we love you. I said, I bet you do. You know, when guys tell you they love you in West Hollywood, you get a bit nervous. What am I doing here with this, this screen? I've got a moldy full screen now. All right. You know, anyway, but I went around asking people, what is it about us that makes us alcoholic? Now, there's lots of things in the book that say it, but they, they weren't nailing it as far as I was concerned. See, what, I, what I'm about to say and what I'm about to talk about ain't quoted in the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. So if you're an alcoholic that's been taught, if it ain't in the book, it don't count, or anything that's not in the book is just an opinion, then you might as well go home and listen to someone else, right? Oh, you are right. Uh, because what I'm about to tell you about my experience isn't quoted in the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. But I love this beautiful book, don't get me wrong. I'm not like decrying the book in any way, shape or form. I just don't think it's infallible and I don't think it contains everything that we know about alcoholism today. Anyway, now that, that's a tangent for another meme. When I got here, I never knew nothing about nothing. I never knew what being an alcoholic was. I don't know what it was about me that made me alcoholic. I'm from Northwest London, London, England. Uh, you probably picked up on that, right? This is the way I speak. Alcohol didn't do this to me. I mean, I speak this way. And, uh, Everybody, everybody drank. I don't know why we drank. We, nobody ever asked why we drank. We didn't have a reason to drink. We didn't have a reason not to drink. Everybody just did. You know, when I came out here, you guys all knew why you're doing it. 
I've heard it here today. I was at two meetings today and people talked about why they drank. And they drank because they couldn't stand who they was. They drank because they couldn't stand the pain. They drank because they had all these issues. Like past the tissues, I got issues. You know, and I think at what stage of the game do you discover that, for Christ's sake? I mean, I couldn't imagine that. I mean, alcoholic, I could not imagine. I couldn't, nobody I, I knew ever talked about that, you know. So I didn't know, so I went round asking. You'd be amazed at what I got told people thought what made them alcoholic. You know, people said all weird things about, you know, what makes me alcoholic. And uh, maybe you wouldn't be amazed, but, you know, they said once too many, a thousand ain't enough. Once I start, I can't stop. I can't stop from starting. I've got a twofold disease, obsession of the mind, allergy of the body, got a spiritual malady, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all that's true if you're alcoholic, but it ain't the deal. It wasn't the deal with me, you know. I'm not decrying any of that, but, you know, what happened for me on January the 15th, 1983, that I never understood and knew was happening at the time, two things happened. One was alcohol stopped working. I didn't even know it had been working. The other thing was I hit bottom. Neither one of those things, alcohol changed my perception of reality and I hit bottom. I didn't know about that and it wasn't in the beautiful book. Anybody read this book, by the way? It's a good idea if you're alcoholic. I never knew what alcohol was doing for me all the years I'd been drinking it, but I learned and I learned good because you know what happened? I had the gift of desperation. I had the gift of desperation. I'm really grateful I had the gift of desperation. G-O-D, happens to spell God. I never wrote that word. I wrote all the other words for God, but I never wrote that one. I had the gift of desperation. And what happened was alcohol stopped working. I didn't even know it had been working, but I learned and I learned good. Alcohol, what it was about that duck and the eagle story it was exactly the same. And you'll relate to it when I tell you what I'm about to tell you. What it is about us that makes us alcoholic is that alcohol changes my perception of reality. Now I know everybody knew that unless I'd asked you first. It don't change my reality. Alcoholics Anonymous changes our reality, but alcohol has been changing my perception of reality. And it's not quoted in the beautiful book. Nearest I got to it is in the doctor's opinion where it says men and women drink primarily because they like the effect produced by alcohol. No problem with that. That alcohol affects every human being, alcoholic or not. But the effect produced by alcohol for alcoholics and, and anybody who drinks alcohol is that alcohol changes how I feel. Alcohol changes how I feel. I hear that in meetings all the time. People say, I like drinking, it changed how I feel. I like the way it made me feel, etc., etc., etc. But there's a total difference between alcohol and alcoholism. A lot of people don't understand it. Alcohol changes how I feel. For me, if I carry on drinking, drink over what we call an invisible line and become alcoholic, now the rules change. Now it's no longer about alcohol changing how I feel, it's about alcoholism changing my perception of reality. In the doctor's opinion, the, the nearest I got to it is the doctor says that they are restless, irritable and discontent unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort which comes at once from taking a few drinks, drinks they see other people taking with impunity. And that's what I did. My three sisters and brother, for example, can drink with impunity. They don't, they're, they're, not, they're not alcoholics, I'm alcoholic. Same blood, same family, same parents, same environment, same everything, I is, they isn't. I got three sisters and a brother, don't understand why I drink. I don't understand why they don't. I ask them, why don't you drink? They say, I don't like it. I say, what? What don't you like about it? They say, well, if I have one too many, I feel sick. I say, sick? You gotta drink past that. Who stops at sick, for Christ's sake? I mean, I puke, but I don't stop drinking. They don't laugh, they think I'm weird. Any other weirdos here tonight? You know, don't want to offend any weirdos if there's any idiots or weirdos in the room, but you know, that's me. Anyway, you know, alcohol changes my perception of reality. And I didn't even know that it was doing that. Alcohol all my life was, now why do I want to change in perception of reality? Because I can't stand reality. That's why I hate reality. I don't like reality and I don't like you in reality. Screw you and screw reality. I don't like reality. That's why I wrote the word sober. S-O-B-E-R. Son of a bitch. Everything's real. I don't like real. 
and when I'm drinking, it changes my perception of reality so that I can stand being here in this rotten world with you rotten people doing rotten shit that I can't stand. And that's what alcohol do. And on January the 15th, 1983, it stopped working. It didn't stop getting me drunk. It didn't stop rotting my liver. It didn't stop getting me in trouble and getting locked up. It stopped changing my perception of reality. And I can't stand reality and I hate reality. So screw that and I'm screwed. I'm destitute in every department and alcohol isn't doing what it's always done for me anymore. But I can't stop from drinking. Alcohol stopped working, but I can't stop doing it because I got a disease called alcoholism, a twofold disease, obsession of the mind, allergy of the body. And when I keep drinking it and drinking it and drinking it and it's not doing it, and the, the disease is more powerful than my, de my decision to try and stop doing it or my desire to quit doing it. I did it anyway, and that's what alcohol does for the alcoholic. It makes me do what I already don't want to do, and I can't not do it just because I don't want to. I've got to not want to do it and then do these steps in this work so that I don't do what I already don't want to do. And if I don't do these steps in this work or I've done these steps in this work, I will do what I don't want to do because the disease I got that I'm powerless over will make me do what I don't want to do. You think I knew that shit when I got here? I never had a clue. Never had a clue. And alcohol isn't working and I'm destitute. And the second thing that happened was I hit bottom. I hit bottom. I looked for it in the beautiful book. wasn't quoted in the beautiful book. It was quoted in the 12 and 12 in the very first step. Bill never wrote it. In it. He didn't realize that his bottom was that white lightning uh, hospital event that he had. He didn't realize that, so he didn't put it in. But in the 12 and 12 that he wrote 12 years later, in the very first step, he says, why all this insistence that every alcoholic must hit bottom first? Well, that's some ballsy shit to say to a bunch of drunks, isn't it? You know, we don't like authoritative figures and, 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 and uh, you know, being told what to do, do we? So here we are, hitting bottom. I hear about hitting bottom, don't know what it means. I go around asking people, what is it? What, what does hitting bottom mean? Well, I get told everybody's bottom's different. Well, it's everybody's bottom is when you stop digging, ha, ha, ha. All that sort of crap, all that podium talk, all that lip flapping party line bullshit that means nothing to nobody but gets bantered around in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because all our bottoms are the same, not different. There's no unity in being different, but people don't realize what their bottom is. So they say what the tail end of their drinking caused them. They, they tell us about the circumstances and the conditions of their life at the tail end of their drinking. And that's not what our bottom is. And that's the outside circumstances. The outside circumstances at the tail end of our drinking is not what the bottom is. People think it is, they say it is. They say I was destitute, the family gone, kids gone, living in an abandoned car, living in uh, you know, penitentiaries, uh, disease, detox, all that. But that's not what hitting bottom is. That's the outside circumstances at the tail end of our drinking. And the danger of believing that those outside circumstances is, is the bottom is that as those outside circumstances get better and improve, we falsely believe we've gotten better and improved and drink again. And that's not good enough. That's why I've got to have a rock solid foundation, fully conceded. You know, I ask people, what, what, you know, what, what's hitting bottom? H-I-T-B-O-T-T-O-M, hit bottom. Hurting inside, totally burnt out, turned to our master. I didn't know this disease had gotten me to turn away from the master, but that's what had happened. You know, when I ask people what their hit in their bottom was, you know, and they tell me, like one little couple that I work with, uh, very, very, uh, I'm very proud of this couple. They work hard at their sobriety. And I said, you know, Bill, Bill, Bill says, we've got to hit bottom first. Have you hit bottom? And they said, yeah, we've hit bottom, Mick. I said, I'm curious. Tell me about it. So the little chickadee, she said, Mick, she said, it's easy. I was feet to the curb, hustling the Broadway, prostituting myself, trying to earn a dollar so that I could get loaded. I said, that wasn't your bottom. She said, well, I think it was. I said, I don't give a shit what you think. I asked her, dude, I said, have you hit bottom, pal? He said, yes, Mick, I've hit bottom. I said, tell me about it. He said, it's easy, Mick. I was locked up in a penitentiary, married to Bubba. I said, that wasn't your bottom. He said, it felt like it was. 
I said, no, that, that was the outside circumstances. Hitting bottom's an inside job, not an outside circumstance. And that's the same for all of us. That inside situation that we reach, where in some capacity or other, you, like me, ended up with the gift of desperation in some, some capacity or other. And on January the 15th, 1983, that's what happened to me. Without knowing what I was saying, without knowing who I was saying it to, without knowing what the consequences and the results of what I was saying and doing was going to be, I didn't know what was happening at the time. But you know, I was so desperate. I was hurting so bad. I don't know what you brought to recovery, but what I brought was a lot of hurt and hate. Hurt and hate. That's what I brought. I hurt and I hate everything. I hated women. I couldn't stand women. I hated homos and queers. I couldn't, could, as anybody different. I hated black people. I was totally racist and prejudiced. I was from London, England, living in Los, uh, living in Los Angeles, and I hated foreigners. I couldn't stand me. I hated you. Get away from me. Don't come near me with all that torment and turmoil going on. I still had to try and present to you a picture of somebody you would like. Because when you're higher powers, what people think of you, if you don't like me, I'm screwed. And that's where I was. And in desperation and despair, without knowing what I was saying or anything else, I can remember very clearly going, help me, please help me. What's wrong with me? And asked for help from outside of myself. An inside job, not an outside circumstance. And although this disease had gotten me to abandon God, God hadn't abandoned me. And when I turned back to him and asked for help, he seemed to be looking over my shoulder and he seemed to say, Mick, you silly bastard. I've been waiting for you to ask. Now get yourself over that 12-step fellowship. Sent me to you guys. I asked for help. He sent me to you. Because here was the power that he provided for an alcoholic of your kind, my kind, our kind, beautiful book says, to not have to drink today. Here it is, right here, right now. You're in Toronto, I'm in Los Angeles, I'm in Long Beach, uh, Los Angeles. And we're alcoholics coming together to do together what we couldn't do apart. I've, 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 I've stayed sober 37 years, 37 plus years. That's insanity. I'm, I'm living proof you ain't the sickest person in this meeting. And I'm living proof they let anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? And here it is. Right here, right now. And I've got news for you. You won't hear anybody else say this. At least I've never heard anybody else say it. But if you're in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, you ain't powerless over alcohol anymore. I know we say that in the first step. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives would become unmanageable. No, not anymore. Not if you're here with us. Not if we're in this thing together. You plus me is a power greater than you. Me plus you is a power greater than me. Together we can do what I couldn't do alone. I couldn't stay sober, you couldn't stay sober, but together we can stay sober. That's why we've never ever done what the very first of the 12 steps says. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, our lives would become unmanageable. We've never done that. You know why? Because we ain't powerless. We are a power so strong we can resist the obsession to drink. And I'm living proof, I'm 37 plus years. And I know many other people. I live across the road, five houses down from me. I got a guy who's 60 years sober living right across from me. I got another guy across the street from me, 40 years. I'm surrounded by people who have resisted the urge to drink because we're together in Alcoholics Anonymous in the fellowship working this beautiful 12-step program, you know? And so those two things, one was alcohol stopped working and the other was I hit bottom. And then I learned what it was about me that made me alcoholic so that I could fully concede to my innermost self that I was. I couldn't fully concede to my innermost self that I was alcoholic if I didn't even know what it was about me that made me alcoholic. So I do today. And, and you know, I'm really happy to, to know that. And I'm, I'm really glad that because, you know, there was, a, there was a contradiction that I couldn't work around. That contradiction was like, Remember, we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. Okay. I didn't have a problem with that, really, until I said, it went on to say, but there's one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. I went, what? How can that be? How can there be one who has all power if alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful? 
couldn't work with that. That was a contradiction. This alcoholic can't, can't work with that until I did the work, until I did what you guys taught me and then I learned. You see, long before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, the disease had been kicking my ass. The disease had been working on me long before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and long before I got it, the disease was getting me to abandon God and spirituality. I knew all about God and Jesus and Buddha and Allah and, and any other noun you want to call it, but you know, I'd long ago abandoned that. But the disease was one day at a time, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, the disease was getting me to abandon God and spirituality so that it could become the power in my life, dictating and dominating everything I say, do, think and feel. And in and of myself, I'm helpless, hopeless and powerless to resist its demands and have to do what it wants me to do, which is drink. But the disease was the negative power. The negative power. God had the positive power. And that's what the disease had done with me. The disease had gotten me to abandon God and spirituality so that I ended up with no God in my life where alcohol was concerned. And, if, and as, as it says, the one who has all power, this one is God, now you find him now. If I gotta find him, it means I ain't got him. And if he's the source and he's the power over everything and I'm powerless over alcohol, all it really means in the first step, powerless is that I'm godless. I'm godless because the disease has gotten me to abandon God so that it could become the negative power in my life, dictating and dominating. And that answered that question too. So I was now on a solid foundation that I could grow with, and I did, and I never drank again, and still haven't 37 years later. You know, I don't know how I'm doing here. I guess I've got a little bit more time. But you know, the 12 steps, why it's so essential, and, and, and a lot of people don't seem to grasp what the 12 steps are all about. What the 12 steps are all about is change. What the 12 steps does for the alcoholic is change who they are so they don't end up in detox over not changing. Everything we are when we get here, everything we bring with us, the disease is already screwed. So if I don't change, the disease will carry on screwing me. If I don't change, I'll keep getting screwed by the disease. I didn't want to keep getting screwed by the disease. So I had to change. C-H-A-N-G-E. Choosing honesty allows new growth every day. And I had to change from the actions you guys taught me to take. A-C-T-I-O-N. Any change to improve our nature. The nature of the beast. The nature of the alcoholic. That's what we had to change. And then if I didn't change, just like the jaywalker, I'd have ended up like screwed. I didn't want to be screwed. And so that's what, I, that's what the 12 steps does. If you look at the 12 steps, apart from the identification in the first and the last step, there's no, there's no, nothing, no mention of alcohol. And, and, and that's it. That, that identification is interchangeable for whatever uh, the 200 plus uh, 12 step programs that there are bantering around now. The identification. But the 12 steps themselves, check them out. They have li very little to do with alcohol and alcoholism. You know, everybody tries to emulate in some capacity or other our 12 steps. They try and make amends and try and right some wrongs and try and, you know, live better lives and be better people and, you know, da 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 da. You can go to Sunday Catholic Church, you can go Saturday uh, synagogue, you can go Muslim on Monday, you, wherever you want to go, whoever you want to do, most people are trying to do some form or other of our 12 steps. Except the difference is, like my three sisters and brother, if they fail or if they don't do it, they don't end up in detox over it. We do. That's why we have to succumb to it. That's why I have to fully concede to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. That gut level honesty, that space two inches behind your belly button that God and you can go to, you know, when, you're, uh, uh, when, you're, when you put your head on the pillow and there's just you and, uh, and nothing else. You know, and, and, and we'll get to apply these principles to all our affairs, you know, and, uh, you know, I've, 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 I'm, I've got some proof of that. This year, I've had a lot of uh, affairs. I've had five major deaths, for example, in the last two years. My mother died. Shortly after that, my manager of 24 years died, along with 75 grand of my money. Right after that, my, my best and closest Youngest sister, born on my belly button birthday, died. Right after that, my son died. Right after that, my best and closest friend and longest friend from the UK died. But you know what? You guys have taught me and taught me well. 
you 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 introduced me to the no no matter what club. We don't drink and drug no matter what. Yeah, my mum died. Yeah, she was old enough. She wanted to go. She was burnt out. My manager, he he had a heart attack. He didn't live right. Wouldn't stop smoking and and eating and and everything else, and had a heart attack. My youngest sister, dementia. She died on a Sunday. Sunday night, I was in the Silby, uh, the uh, East Bay Speakers meeting where I go every Sunday with my troops. On the Monday, my 36-year-old son, my only son, he died. On the Monday night, I was at my home group meeting, Silby Beach Speakers meeting. On the Tuesday, my best and closest, longest friend from the UK died. On the Tuesday, I was at my Nomads Men's Stag. Three different deaths, three different meetings, three different days. RIP, rest in peace, became recovery is priority. Right after that, I nearly died. My heart gave out. 28 days, I was in the hospital. I had to repair my heart, practically replace it. You know, wasn't all bad. You know, A lot of the damage that was caused to my heart was when I was smoking. I haven't smoked for 36, my, uh, 37 years. Since before I quit drinking, I quit smoking. January 1st, 1983, I quit smoking. January 15th, I quit drinking. But the 25 years prior to that, that I had been smoking cigarettes, I've done a lot of damage to my heart and it doesn't go away. So if you smoke cigarettes or anything else, be warned, a little tangent now. You know, I was in the hospital. One of the things that happened in the hospital, you guys have taught me over the years to do H&I work, hospitals and institutions, or as I call it, homies and inmates. You taught me how to give love and service. And I've been doing that for year after year after year. But when I went in that hospital and I was practically dying, 28 days I was in there, you guys taught me how to receive love. You came and gave me H&I. You came to the hospital. You swarmed in that hospital. The matron of the hospital was dumbfounded. She couldn't believe it. She was saying to me, who are you? Who are you? Why is my hospital filled up? Who are all these people coming to see you? Well, who are you? She didn't understand. You guys swamped me. You brought me H&I. And you taught me how to receive love. And for that, I'm ever grateful. The, the, the heart was a somewhat of a success, but it wasn't a total success. One more time. Look, I've got my little monitor here. You know, the little thing that you put on your finger where you read your, your monitor and whatever. And I, and I came out of the hospital, but things wasn't right. But a sober sister, one of our old groupies from years back become a nurse, a heart nurse, a cardiac nurse. And I was talking to her one night and I was telling her what my readings on my monitor was. And she said, get off the phone, she said, and call the paramedics. She said, you're going to die. I said, no, I'm going to bed. She said, you're not going to bed. She said, your, your readings that you're telling me, she said, are fatal. She said, call the paramedics. I said, really? She said, really? Sober sister. I did. I got off the phone and I called, I called the paramedics. They came and picked me up, took me to ICU, plugged me into the monitors there. That night, my heart stopped three times, 14 seconds, eight seconds, and four seconds. If I'd gone to bed, you'd have a different speaker here right now. They put a battery in, like, look, uh, they put a pacemaker in. I'm battery operated. I'm a bionic bush. It's not all bad. Some of you ladies prefer it battery operated, so I'm told. Did I really just say that? <laughs> but anyway, you know, I, uh, I've recovered and my health is really good now. You can tell I'm busy. I'm doing stuff. I'm, you know, I've got people in my life. I've got relationships. I wrote the word relationships. We apply these principles to all our affairs, like especially our personal relationships. R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-S-H-I-P. Really exciting love affair turns into outrageous nightmare. Sobriety hangs in peril. Relationships. We're not very good at them. 
I'm going to wind this up and I'm going to read my favorite page out of a beautiful book just to endorse what I've been talking about because I've got to split. Page 386, folks, from a, from a story called Me, an Alcoholic. It says, um, blimey, there's a lot of people here. It says, I looked up an AA meeting and went there alone. I did that. Here I found an ingredient that had been lacking in any other effort I'd made to save myself. Here was power. Here was power to live to the end of any given day. Power to have the courage to face the next day. Power to have friends. Power to help people. Power to be sane. Power to stay sober. That was seven years ago and many AA meetings ago, and I haven't had a drink during those seven years. Moreover, I am deeply convinced that so long as I continue to strive in my fumbling way towards the principles I first encountered in the earlier chapters of this book, this remarkable power will continue to flow through me. What is this power? With my AA friends, all I can say is that it's a power greater than myself. If pressed, all I can do is follow the psalmist who said it long before me. Be still and know that I am God. That's good shit, isn't it? And it's all here in the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Look, you read this beautiful book. Look, this is what it means to me. A-L-C-O-H-O-L-I-C-S. Alcoholics. A-N-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S. Alcoholics Anonymous. A life centered on helping others lives in complete sobriety. Actions, not our names, yield maintenance of unity and service. And that's what we got. That's what we got here in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what we're doing here right now. One alcoholic coming together with another alcoholic to do together what they couldn't do apart. You couldn't stay sober, I couldn't stay sober, but together we can stay sober. We are a power so strong, we can resist the, the obsession to drink. And with that, I'm gonna say namaste. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. I, I get excited, as you can probably tell. I'm more, more thrilled today, 37 years later, than I've ever been. It's more thrilling and more exhilarating to be among you, to be a small part of this great whole. And I'm going to leave you. Thank you for allowing me to be with you. God bless. Namaste. Thanks, Mickey. Thank you so much, Mickey. Wow. Beautiful. Carry thank on. Thank you so much, Mickey. Yeah. Um, I just I want to thank Mickey again. Um, you know, your, your enthusiasm, your passion, your excitement, just fantastic. Uh, it's, it's infectious brother. Thank you so, so, so very much for joining us tonight. Obviously I, I realize Mickey's got to go, but, um, well, if we could give him another round. Thanks guys. Um, now, awesome. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, I'm going to, uh, we have a reading that we, we do to close off the, the meeting. It's a, a vision for you. Uh, on page 164. I just want to touch on anonymity. Anonymity is the spiritual oh, foundation of all of our traditions. What you see here, what you hear here, please let it stay here. Um, and uh, I, I've asked my friend JJH to read a vision for you for us. So I'm just going to unmute you, Jay. Go hey, ahead, baby. Jay. Thanks, Dustin. Hi, everyone. My name's Jay. I'm a member of the Gerard Road Group, and I am an alcoholic. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is a great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thanks, Jay. Beautiful. Thank, thank you, Jay. Uh, Rob, do you have uh, any announcements or anything you'd like to? Uh... Uh, no, just uh, next week. We have another great speaker coming next week, 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Daylight Time. So come on by. Yeah, next week, Roy T. from uh, India has a, has a great message and uh, very comical as well. I uh, hope to see everyone back next week. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll uh, un allow you to unmute mute yourself now and, and have some fellowship.